Hi, everyone. On today's podcast, we're going to talk about the research evidence on eating and drinking during labor. Welcome to the Evidence-Based Birth Podcast. My name is Rebecca Decker, and I'm a nurse with my PhD and the founder of Evidence-Based Birth. Join me each week as we work together to get evidence-based information into the hands of families and professionals around the world. As a reminder, this information is not medical advice. See evbirth.com slash disclaimer for more details. Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of the Evidence-Based Birth Podcast. My name is Rebecca Decker, pronouns she, her, and I will be your host for today's episode. Before I get into the evidence, I wanted to make a quick announcement. Over the past week, our professional membership for birth workers here at Evidence-Based Birth has been on sale for 20% off. And the sale ended yesterday, but I was never able to announce the sale on the podcast while it was happening. So we are doing a special extension of the 20% off sale for podcast listeners only. We only offer the sale price twice per year. So if you're interested in becoming a pro member at EBB, this is your chance. Just go to ebbirth.com slash membership. And when you register, use the coupon code FALL21SALE in all capital letters. That's fall then the number 21, then SALE in all caps. We'll keep that coupon code open for podcast listeners for the next two days only. I'll also post a link to the membership and the coupon code in the show notes for this episode. All right, in this episode, we're going to take a deep dive into the research evidence on eating and drinking during labor. I have some good news for you. If you haven't seen it already, we do have a signature article on this topic which means we have a peer-reviewed full-length article that goes into a lot of detail, more than I'm going to go into on this podcast. And you can find that signature article at evbirth.com slash eating. We also have a free one-page handout on this topic that you can share with your provider or with your clients. And you can download that handout by joining our newsletter and clicking the button at the top of evbirth.com slash eating. También tenemos una traducción al español del folleto de una página al que puede acceder en evidencebasedbirth.com slash translations. I'm so excited to talk with you about the research evidence on eating and drinking during labor. This is one of the topics that sparked the idea to create evidence-based birth. Because when I was giving birth to my first child in 2008, I was not allowed to eat or drink anything, not even ice chips, during my 24-hour labor experience. By the end of that experience, after I'd given birth, I was really weak and exhausted from hunger. And they were so strict that the nurses wouldn't even let me take my normal allergy medicine with a sip of water. They wouldn't even allow me the tiniest sip of water and a tiny antihistamine for my allergies. This happened at an academic medical center at a major university 13 years ago. So afterwards, I was really curious, what was the evidence on this practice? I followed the rules because I believed that they were doing something, that they had these rules to protect me. But what did the evidence say? Was this harmful or was it helpful, or did it have no effect at all? If you're interested in learning more about what happened at that birth and afterwards, you can read all about it in my book, Babies Are Not Pizzas, They're Born Not Delivered, which you can find wherever books are sold. Side note, when I'm talking about drinking during labor, I'm talking about drinking oral fluids, not alcohol. Back when I was a college professor and I used to talk with the university students about birth and how they didn't let me drink in labor and what's the evidence on drinking during labor, they would always have the initial thought that I was talking about drinking alcohol. But no, I am just talking about drinking regular oral fluids like this one I have in my hand right now. So with that, drink, <laughs> let's get started. So I am not alone. In many hospitals around the world, people are still told not to eat or not to drink during labor. The medical term for this is NPO, three capital letters, NPO, which comes from the Latin nil per os, which means nothing by mouth. In a survey that was published by the Listening to Mothers research team in 2014, researchers found that 60% of mothers in the United States who gave birth in a U.S. hospital reported not drinking fluids during labor and 80% said that they did not eat anything during labor. But when you look at freestanding birth centers that are run by midwives, 
And people are free to eat and drink as they wish in freestanding birth centers. Very few of them choose not to eat or drink, only 5%. The vast majority of people who give birth at home in freestanding birth centers, when they have autonomy, they do choose to eat or drink. So what are the energy needs of people in labor? Well, the uterus is a muscle, and I have here my little plush uterus made by iHeartGuts. It says, uterus, get a womb. And this uterus is mostly muscle tissue in real life, and muscles use fuel as they work, and they require nutrition to meet those energy needs. So when you're in labor and the uterus is contracting, it's literally like squeezing. It's a muscle that's working over and over and over again. Plus, you have your normal nutrition needs during labor. We don't really have much research about the nutrition needs of people in labor, but research in sports nutrition has found that taking in carbohydrates during exercise may improve performance and protect against fatigue. And ketosis. Ketosis means that there are raised levels of ketones that can be measured in blood and urine. During times of starvation, ketones take fat from the liver and burn it for energy. A lot of people these days are using ketosis for different health conditions, so it's not necessarily harmful in and of itself, but we don't know for sure whether ketosis during labor is normal and harmless or if it requires you to prevent it with food and drink. So many hospitals around the world still have NPO policies. So what's the impact on people giving birth? We have a Cochrane review that was published in 2013 by Singata et al. In this review, they combine evidence from five trials with a total of about 3,100 people who were randomly assigned to eat, drink, or not during labor. All of them were in active labor and at low risk for needing a cesarean. A few of the trials reached opposite conclusions on outcomes like how common cesareans were or vomiting or labor duration. Unfortunately, none of the researchers looked at satisfaction, and the results concluded there is no harm or benefit in restricting low-risk people from consuming food and drink during labor. Another review was published in 2017 looking at the benefits and harms of food and drink during labor. They included all five studies from that Cochrane review I just mentioned, and they added five more, amounting to about 4,000 participants. They found that the people who had less restrictive eating and drinking policies had shorter labors, but the time difference is very small, only about 16 minutes, and they didn't find any other differences in health outcomes. Only one of the trials reported satisfaction and found that the people in labor who were permitted to eat reported higher levels of satisfaction with their nourishment during labor. 97% of them were satisfied compared with 55% of the other group. There were no cases of aspiration in any of the trials. However, none of the trials were large enough to determine how often this rare outcome could truly occur. So aspiration is the main reason why people are not allowed to eat and drink in some hospitals, the fear of aspiration. This whole policy of nothing by mouth originated in the 1940s. It was based on doctors' fears that a person will inhale or aspirate stomach contents while they're under general anesthesia for an emergency cesarean. However, the increase in the use of epidurals and advances in surgery and anesthesia have made aspiration almost unheard of today. Back in the 1940s, people were given inhaled anesthetics, either ether or chloroform in imprecise amounts, or they were given twilight sleep, which is an injection of morphine and scopolamine that causes unconsciousness and no memory of the birth. Back then in the mid 1900s, anesthesia was not very safe and aspiration was pretty common. Once it was recognized as a major problem in the 1940s, back then anesthesiologists were using very primitive tools to keep a person's airway open when they were under general anesthesia. And some anesthesiologists didn't use airway tools at all. And sometimes the anesthesia was not administered by anesthesiologists. Sometimes it was nurses or medical residents who were doing the anesthesia. In 1946, Dr. Curtis Mendelson published a study that is basically responsible for all of the nothing by mouth policies around the world today. He found that people who had general anesthesia while giving birth could 
inhale their stomach contents, which in rare cases could lead to severe lung disease or death. He named this illness after himself, which is pretty typical for a lot of male doctors at that time, and the illness was called Mendelssohn's syndrome. When he looked at about 44,000 women who gave birth between the 1930s and 1940s, he found that aspiration occurred in 66 of these women. All of these women had been given a mixture of gas, ether, and oxygen through a mask during the delivery, and it was not clear if any of these women had their airways protected during the birth. Back then, you got to remember, general anesthesia was not limited to cesarean deliveries. It was also used to, quote, knock people out during a vaginal birth. For example, my mother experienced that. She not only had twilight sleep with morphine and scopolamine, but when the time came for the baby to come out, they put a gas mask on her face and knocked her out as the baby was born. In the study that Mendelssohn did, more than half of the people had a longer anesthesia time and greater anesthesia depth than normal. And most of the aspirations were from liquids and only a few were from solids. Mendelssohn thought that aspirations are preventable, and he recommended replacing oral intake with IV fluids. He also recommended switching to local anesthesia when possible instead of general anesthesia. His advice caught on, and nothing by mouth became the norm in hospitals across the U.S. and around the world. And this practice has persisted, becoming a part of hospital culture, even though people giving birth today are nothing like the people giving birth back then. Back then, a lot of people were exposed to general anesthesia routinely and without any airway protection. So if we jump ahead to more modern times, in 1997, researchers conducted the first large U.S. study to look at maternal deaths from anesthesia towards the end of the 1900s. They found that general anesthesia was used in 41% of the sample in the earlier part of the study in the late 70s and early 80s, and the use of general anesthesia dropped to 16% of the sample in later years in the late 1980s. The risk of death as a result of aspiration during a cesarean during this time period was 0.7 per 1 million births, or you could do the math and say it was one death for every 1.4 million births. A follow-up study looked at anesthesia-related maternal deaths in the United States between 1991 and 2002. In this time period, general anesthesia was used about 14% of the time, and they found that anesthesia-related maternal deaths fell 60% when they compared data from the 1980s to data from the 1990s. And they calculated that there were about 6.5 maternal deaths per million anesthetics from the later years of the sample. Now, they couldn't say exactly how many of those deaths were related to aspiration because they didn't really track that. Another study from Michigan in the 1980s and 1990s reported eight anesthesia-related deaths. Five involved general anesthesia, and none of the women in that study died from aspiration. Now, some people may argue that we have fewer deaths from aspiration today because people aren't allowed to eat or drink during labor. However, in the United Kingdom, clinical guidelines were updated in 2007 to recommend that people be offered drinks and a light meal during labor. So it could be helpful to look at deaths from aspiration in the United Kingdom when they began to encourage eating and drinking during labor. The United Kingdom reviews every pregnancy-related death in regular confidential inquiries into maternal death reports. Between the years 2000 and 2008, which spanned three reports, One woman died of aspiration out of more than 6 million births. The death occurred between 2006 and 2008, and it's not clear whether this was before or after the change in guidelines. The woman in this particular case had a known placenta previa and was hospitalized for monitoring, but she was not in labor. She consumed a full meal in the hospital, but then started bleeding due to the previa and had an emergency cesarean with general anesthesia. She vomited while the tube was being removed in the recovery room and died a few days later from the resulting aspiration pneumonitis. Their report recommended that when general anesthesia is administered in a suspected full stomach situation, that the person should ideally be fully awake and able to protect their airway when it comes time for the tube to be removed from their airway. Attempts to reduce stomach contents if you have a full stomach and you're having general anesthesia by inserting a tube into the stomach 
should also take place, but in this case, that was not done. So this could have been prevented. Everyone going into labor is assumed to be at risk for aspiration because it's not possible to predict who will end up needing a cesarean under general anesthesia. However, the studies I just talked about show that aspiration death is extremely rare in the overall birthing population. This is because few cesareans today require general anesthesia, and when they do, they're able to manage the airway much better than they used to. So that's the risk of aspiration. We go into more depth in our signature article about what's the possibility of illness from aspiration, which you can read more at ebbirth.com slash eating. But we do have data from North America where 30 hospitals provided information on more than 300,000 people giving birth. They looked at people who had epidurals or general anesthesia. Most people had an epidural in the study. And general anesthesia counted for about 5 to 6% of cesareans in the study. This took place between 2004 and 2009. Out of the 5,000 women who received general anesthesia, there were zero cases of aspiration. And we don't know how many of these people who had general anesthesia were eating or drinking during labor. Another interesting study published by Cook was done in 2011 by the Royal College of Anesthetists and the Difficult Airway Society in the United Kingdom. And out of 720,000 births that took place between 2008 and 2009, they only documented one case of aspiration, and the aspiration wasn't considered the primary cause of the woman's airway problems. Instead, in this situation, the birthing person's main complication was due to the fact that they had difficulty placing a tube in her airway to protect the airway. That mother gave birth to a live infant and had a full recovery. So that is kind of some of the data on the history of aspiration and why it's not really considered to be a common problem today. It's considered to be extremely rare because of the many advances in anesthesiology and protecting the airway, as well as the fact that very few people relative to pastimes have general anesthesia with a cesarean. I mentioned the Cochrane Review earlier about the research evidence on eating and drinking during labor, and the authors of that Cochrane Review noted that most people seem to naturally limit their intake as labor gets stronger, and they concluded that low-risk people have the right to choose whether or not they would like to eat or drink during labor. And they mentioned that there's no randomized trial has looked at eating during labor in people who are at high risk of needing a cesarean with general anesthesia. So most of the studies we have on eating and drinking during labor tend to be in low-risk people who are not likely to have general anesthesia with a cesarean. Interestingly, in a recent position statement update, the American Association of Anesthesiologists reviewed much of the same evidence as the Cochrane reviewers, and they decided that because there isn't evidence of harm or benefit, that hospitals should limit solid food during labor. So they err on the side of I think protecting hospitals from liability. And they did not talk about maternal satisfaction or nourishment needs at all in their opinion. We found two recent studies published by researchers in Iran that surveyed mothers on their perceptions of food and drink restrictions during labor. The first study by Manaza and Leela interviewed 600 women and found an association between reported pain levels and environmental sources of stress meaning that laboring people under stress experienced more pain. And one of the greatest reported sources of stress for women in the study was, quote, restricted fluid intake, so not being allowed to drink oral fluids. About half of first-time moms and 78% of women who had given birth before mentioned this as a stressor. So that lines up with a lot of what we hear from people at evidence-based birth who say that being told they're not allowed to eat or drink anything during labor can be stressful for them. In another study, a published Iravani et al., they did in-depth interviews with 24 low-risk women after they gave birth, but before they left the hospital. The women were in three different hospitals, demographically diverse, and they all had healthy infants. So they looked at the interview responses and grouped them into common themes. And one of the reoccurring responses from this qualitative research study was disappointment about restrictions on eating and drinking during labor. Women commented that they, quote, felt out of energy, 
quote, had no more strength, end quote, felt hungry from going so long without eating. Ultimately, people have the human right to decide whether or not they would like to eat or drink fluids during labor or not. And I like to remind people, especially who take our EBB childbirth class, that hospital policy is not binding on patients, including those in labor. And hospitals do not have the legal authority to prevent you from eating or drinking to nourish yourself if you so choose. So going back to um, what anesthesiologists are doing, in 2015, there was a lot of news about the annual meeting of anesthesiologists because there were several researchers at that conference who reported research findings that most healthy people would benefit from a light meal during labor. This was published by Hardy et al. in 2015. These researchers combined 385 research studies on hospital births that were published in 1990 or later, and they also reviewed the American Society of Anesthesiology's Closed Claims Project database, looking at lawsuits. In all, they found only one case of aspiration in the entire United States between the years 2005 and 2013, and this happened in a woman who had preeclampsia. They concluded that fasting or NPO is not necessary if you're low risk. And in fact, they think that fasting leading to ketosis could make stomach juices more dangerously acidic if there were an aspiration. The researchers mentioned a few circumstances that can increase the risk of aspiration, including eclampsia, preeclampsia, and the use of IV intravenous opioids, such as morphine, to manage labor pain. They ended their paper by saying that more research focusing on high-risk births is needed, but people with those risk factors could potentially benefit from fasting during labor, but it's not really necessary in anybody else. We called those authors and did an interview with them a couple years ago just to talk with them about like what's going on and how did they come to these conclusions. And they told us, you know, these are anesthesiologists. They were telling us that the anesthesiology profession has made great progress since the 1940s. Even though cesarean rates have risen as high as 32% of all U.S. births, there's been a wide increase in the use of epidurals during surgery, which has resulted in far fewer anesthesia-related maternal deaths. When a general anesthetic has to be used, when you have to be put to sleep during a cesarean, Doctors use newer strategies to reduce the volume of stomach contents and to make your stomach juices less acidic by administering medications, and they use newer techniques to keep your airway safe. And none of these advances were available back in Dr. Mendelssohn's time. So the researchers from that meeting, Hardy and all, concluded that nothing by mouth is an outdated restriction that should not be applied to low-risk people giving birth today. And their findings were echoed in a 2016 opinion paper published by Sperling et al. in the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Unfortunately, the guidelines from these organizations have not changed yet, even though researchers are putting out this information. So I want to go over a couple scenarios and thoughts. One is, does the stomach really empty when you're fasting during labor? So when I was told not to eat or drink anything, not even ice chips, not even a sip of water to take my medication. Did that mean my stomach was empty by the end of my labor? What if I needed general anesthesia for an emergency cesarean? So the main reason people have the nothing by mouth policy is to ensure that you will have an empty stomach if you need an emergency surgery with general anesthesia. So stomach emptying does slow down once labor starts. So fasting for 8, 12, or even 24 hours after contractions begin, like I did, still does not guarantee an empty stomach at the time of birth. There was a small study published in 1992 by Carp et al. that looked at used ultrasound imaging to look at the contents of the stomach of 39 healthy full-term women who were in active labor after they got their epidurals. The women told the researchers, but not the person giving the ultrasound exam, when they had last eaten. So the ultrasound technician did not know when they had last eaten. The ultrasound found solid food in about two-thirds of their stomachs. Of the 25 who reported not eating for 8 to 24 hours, 
16 still had solid food in their stomachs at the time of the ultrasound. And importantly, the presence of solid food in the stomach was not related to how long you had gone without eating. So although labor likely slows down the process of your stomach emptying out, Another small study published by Bataille et al. in 2014 suggests that people with epidurals still may have their stomachs able to empty. So I see a lot of hospitals now where they're like, you can only eat if you avoid an epidural. As soon as you have an epidural, it's MPO, you're not allowed to have any food or anything to eat or maybe even anything to drink. So what's the evidence on that? Well, this study looked at 60 laboring people with epidurals and tracked the changes in their stomach contents during labor. And they found that in early labor, half of them had substantial amounts of stomach contents, even though most of them had been without liquids for more than five hours and without solids for more than 13 hours. So this does show that the stomach emptying slows down at the start of labor. However, they said by the pushing phase, 90% of them no longer were at risk for aspiration, meaning that the stomach did continue to empty even though they had an epidural. And the researchers concluded that neither the length of fasting nor the presence of stomach contents at the start of labor are good indicators of whether or not you're at risk for aspiration further along in labor. So just because you have an epidural, that is no, there's no evidence-based good reason to prevent you from eating or drinking during labor. When we look at the guidelines, there are several professional organizations that recommend that you eat or drink as you desire during labor if you're at low risk for complications. And that includes the World Health Organization, the American College of Nurse Midwives, the NICE Clinical Guidance for the United Kingdom, and the Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Canada. Canada is interesting because although Canadian guidelines recommend the option of food and drink, Researchers uh, surveyed 118 hospitals in Canada, and this was published by Chikowitz et al. in 2016, and they found that the majority of low-risk people were not allowed to eat or drink during active labor. In early labor, 98% of low-risk people were free to consume fluids and solids. However, by the time they got to active labor, 60% of people without epidurals and 83% of those with an epidural were restricted to ice chips and clear fluids. And the authors concluded with their hope that this study will spark revisions of current hospital policy to be in line with Canadian professional guidelines and best practices. There are some organizations that recommend that if you're low risk, you avoid solid food in labor, but you're free to drink clear liquids, such as water, sports drinks, black coffee, tea, and soda. And that includes the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and the American Society of Anesthesiologists. In their position statement, the American Society of Anesthesiologists noted that aspiration has become so rare that randomized trials and even large databases have been unable to calculate an incidence. And they say, quote, there is insufficient evidence to draw conclusions about the relationship between fasting times for clear liquids or solids and the risk of aspiration during delivery, end quote. In the absence of the evidence that they said they didn't have, they decided to base their guidelines on expert opinion. So they did an official survey of 357 members of the American Society of Anesthesiologists, and 77% believed that clear liquids were okay if you're low risk. And 91% said nobody should have solid food in labor. So those opinions of those individual anesthesiologists became the basis of the practice guidelines for the American Society of Anesthesiologists. And many anesthesiologists in the United States are the ones who set these policies. And that's why we still have lots of no eating during labor policies in the United States because of their opinions, not because of the evidence. We believe here at Evidence-Based Birth that it is not evidence-based practice to allow opinions and culture to restrict people's autonomy simply because they think evidence from credible studies is not available, when I've already told you there actually are studies examining this topic. Now, I do want to point out that neither ACOG nor ASA, the American Society of Anesthesiologists, recommends restricting low-risk people to ice chips or sips of water during labor. So if you are seeing that anywhere near you where you're only allowed ice chips or sips of water, even with an epidural, that is totally out of line and against the professional guidelines. So providers that are enforcing these strict NPO policies, like what I experienced, 
are not in line with their professional organization standards of best practice. In a statement from 2017, ACOG's Committee on Obstetric Practice reaffirmed their recommendation to allow low-risk people free access to moderate amounts of clear liquids. Unfortunately, they continued advising against consuming solid foods while in labor, but they noted that the evidence for this recommendation has been questioned and is under review. So in 2009, when ACOG revised the recommendations and they started allowing clear liquids, because before that, they didn't even allow clear liquids. It was part of a wider trend in the anesthesia community to relax rules on fasting before all surgeries. A meta-analysis of randomized trials comparing fasting times of two to four hours versus more than four hours, found that the patients who fasted longer were at greater risk of aspiration from larger and more acidic stomach contents. And this was published in 2017 and linked to in our signature article. And they wrote that healthy patients undergoing elective surgeries are now advised to consume clear liquids up until two hours before the procedure instead of the standard NPO after midnight, which countless nurses around the country have enforced NPO after midnight. If you've ever worked night shift as a nurse, you have enforced an NPO after midnight order. So kind of to go back and summarize what we've talked about, in the mid-1900s when anesthesia methods were crude and unsafe and lots of women died from anesthesia during childbirth, these nothing-by-mouth policies came about to help prevent the dangerous consequences of aspiration with general anesthesia. But now that the safety of general anesthesia has greatly improved, hospital policies need to be rewritten to be in line with the current evidence. And we're starting to see some movement in that direction. Some hospitals I hear of are encouraging or permitting food and drink during labor. Others are maybe allowing oral drinks, but not food. Others maybe allow you to drink and eat, but not once you have an epidural. The research is limited, but fasting as soon as labor starts does not guarantee an empty stomach if you have an emergency cesarean. Fasting could even be harmful because it can cause stomach juices to become dangerously acidic if an aspiration were to occur. Overall, the Cochrane Review of five randomized trials with low-risk people did not find any evidence of harm or benefit from eating or drinking or not during labor. Maybe we would have seen benefits if the trials looked at maternal satisfaction, but none of them did. However, that other larger review included a study that did look at maternal satisfaction, and they found that 97% of people who were permitted to eat and drink had satisfaction with their nourishment during labor versus 55% of those who were not permitted to eat and drink. Here at Evidence-Based Birth, we believe that the issue of eating and drinking during labor should be reframed as one of bodily choice. If you're doing fine and you're not having some severe life-threatening complication, you have the right to decide whether or not you'd like to eat or drink during labor. Even if you have an epidural, that should not prevent you from eating and drinking during labor. And we also have to consider your satisfaction with the experience and with pain control And we know that people complain about their distress when they are denied food and drink during labor. Other people maybe not won't feel hungry during labor, and that's fine too. The issue is it should be an issue of choice. If you're high risk, the informed consent discussion might look a little bit different. There really is not evidence that we can apply to your situation, and more research needs to be done to define high risk factors for aspiration, but There is some evidence that if you have an airway that's difficult to manage or eclampsia, preeclampsia, or if you're receiving IV opioids, morphine, like medications during labor, you might be able to lower your risk of aspiration by fasting during labor, although the evidence is kind of unclear on that. So that concludes this article and podcast about eating and drinking during labor. I hope you found it interesting and helpful. I know we still run up against a lot of cultural barriers to eating food during labor, and I hear a lot of nurses say things like, it's not going to feel good coming back out and stuff like that. And I just think, well, that's not a very encouraging thing to say to somebody who's hungry and wants to eat. Yes, you may vomit later in labor if you eat earlier in labor, but that's your choice. And vomiting is not necessarily an unhealthy part of the labor process. I know that in my second birth, when I was able to eat and drink, when I did throw up or vomit at the end of labor, 
it was almost like a wave through my body that forced my baby further down, which I found interesting. So we talk a little bit more about nausea and vomiting in our IV fluids article, which I'll do a separate podcast about. But if you're interested in the evidence on using IV fluids to replace when you're not able to drink oral fluids or perhaps you can't drink enough oral fluids. We cover that in our article at ebbirth.com slash IV fluids. So I hope this was helpful for you. If you want, we have a one-page handout that summarizes this topic. It's available at ebbirth.com slash eating. And I hope you enjoy this podcast and the rest of your day. Thanks everyone. Bye.